forward. It's going to be only America first. America first. We're going to be coming to you twice a month on the podcast. I look back on where we are today and building AFPI, and I sincerely believe the time in the White House was actually in preparation for what <laughs> yeah. we're building now. Welcome to the show. Well, welcome to the show. This is the America First Agenda. I'm Chad Wolf, the Executive Director of the America First Policy Institute and former Acting Secretary of DHS. Here at the America First Agenda, we go behind the scenes with the 45th President's Cabinet staff, policymakers, but also other prominent leaders working to build America where Americans come first. Today, we are recording at the America First Policy Institute's inaugural Atlanta Policy Summit. We're very, very excited. We've had a great uh, day and a half. We've got another half day to go here. Uh, and I'm very excited who we have in the chair. Uh, we have probably most, one of the most interesting men that I have heard from, and that's not a commercial, although that is like a beer commercial. I that think is a beer it, commercial, it is a yes. Commercial. Though I don't we drink, so you we know, have, I'll we have Jack Sobic in the chair, who is our senior editor of uh, Human Events, also host of the Human Events Daily podcast, also a podcaster. So very good. I've got a long introduction here for you because we're going to be talking about China. <laughs> so I want to I want to give a little bit of your creds. More, more or less. I appreciate that. On why you are an expert in this field, but also why what you say I think matters to a lot of different individuals. So, Naval Intelligence Officer, uh, the Navy Special Warfare, Navy Expeditionary Combat Command, Indo Pacific region, two years living and working in China, international business, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Shanghai, fluent Mandarin. I'm not going to ask you to speak Mandarin because I wouldn't understand <laughs> any of it. Um, but just a, a student probably of China, CCP, kind of their mentality, which, yes. you know, as acting secretary of DHS, I got asked a lot, a couple of different questions. They asked it different ways. What keeps you up at night? But also, what is the biggest threat facing the homeland? Mm. Um, and we could always talk about the border. We could always talk about things that were impacting Americans every day. But I always said that the, 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 the most severe threat, existential threat facing the homeland today, not tomorrow, today, was communist China uh, for a variety of different reasons, which I'm happy to go into. But um, so we are super excited to have you on the agenda. Thanks not only for being at the, the summit, but for being on the podcast. So welcome. Well, and I appreciate that, Secretary Wolf. And, uh, you know, just to in case anybody wants to come out there and clarify, I was not Naval Special Warfare. I was an Intel weenie, uh, but I did serve with with people in Naval yeah. Special Warfare and uh, Expeditionary Command as um, actually my last deployment. I was a uh, Expeditionary Command uh, for JTF um, or CTF 75 out of uh, operating out of Guam in the Asia Pacific region, um, specifically as the N2 Intel director for that um, for that CTF. So we were, um, you know, stationed out of Guam, but then we would, you know, conduct uh, various, you know, operations and trainings with partner forces throughout yeah. the Asia Pacific region. Um, now they call it the Indo Asia Pacific region. Right. So I have to I have to retrain myself to <laughs> to say that. But um, you know, and but there's for, with good reason, yeah. obviously, because uh, our relationship with India, particularly from you know both a military, social, cultural, economic yeah. level, is going to be and will be one of the most important leverage points for us in East Asia uh, regarding. Well, not that they're in East Asia, but for the Asia Pacific yeah. in order to counter China. Yeah. Well, I may have gotten the. Uh, your description wrong on that so well no, no, apologies, no, 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 no. I think that's a good clarification um, look you're also an AFPI ambassador which we say thank you for, for doing well, that I'm very April excited Fine. to be involved with AFPI and you know everything with the summit here and for folks that um, aren't able to attend for the first one make sure you come out to the second one but I believe everything's being broken up into podcasts and yeah. live streams to check out and it's it's you don't really hear a lot of these types of discussions being had in this type of environment and at this level. So it's just amazing to be yeah. here. So let's talk a little bit, just real briefly, about that America First movement, right? So I, I don't, you know, I, I talk about this a lot, just given what I do these days. Um, I think it, it started before President Trump's administration. Well, I would uh, think so, you yeah. Know, it started way back, um, you could say Reagan or even, even go back a little bit more. Uh, I think President Trump really started to clarify what it meant uh, and really started talking about a variety of different policies from economic policy to security policy to foreign policy to everything in between about let's start talking about what benefits Americans most first and foremost. Right. And let's not worry about international alliances or what our uh, partners think. It's, not, it's, it's important to understand how they think. It's important to understand ramifications. But when I make decisions as the president, I'm going to channel him for a minute, uh, it's what benefits Americans first and foremost. So as you think about that, and obviously 
uh, associated with AFPI uh, in a way, but just the America First movement. What is it? I mean, do you have that same view or do you come at it from We're really, a different perspective? really coming at it from an international relations perspective. And I think that, you know, I think that a lot of people and certainly, you know, can go on about the mainstream media, the way they mischaracterize things. They hear the phrase America first. And yet, for some reason, in their minds, they translate it to America only. Right. Right. And that's not what it means. It's it's a mindset and it's a way of approaching international relations, um, certainly related to the realist school, where whereby in a national leader doesn't do what's in the best interests of some, you know, broad serving uh, international alliance or agreement or, you know, some U.N. directive, but comes to international relations from the perspective of supporting the best needs of the people who elected them to the office. Um, so in this case, obviously here in the United States, we do have a system of a constitutional republic, we have electoral college, we elect a president, that person then goes on to represent all 50 states and territories. And so when we were looking at so many of the things that we were doing, and when I would look at this, you know, at serving in uh, Navy intelligence, and you start kind of questioning, why are we so involved in some of these things? Uh, in various parts of the world, um, a lot of the kinetic operations that we're doing that don't really seem to have a lot of direct impact on the homeland versus, you know, and I would I always kind of tell the story that I, South China Sea where I'm watching yeah. the, uh, the CCP and, and their military forces build up these islands in the South China Sea. And it's, well, sir, and it's under, you know, President Obama. Well, you know, and sending the information up the chain, well, right. sir, they're, they've started dredging the, you know, yeah. dredging the South China Sea, and it's, it's actually quite shallow there uh, compared to some other parts of the ocean that are nearby, honestly. And, um, you know, they're dredging it, and they're building the islands, and, well, sir, they're militarizing the islands, and uh, they're populating the islands. Now the islands are, we're going to issue a demarche. We're going to issue a, right. uh, yeah. you know, an ASEAN statement, and everyone talks about what's going to win in the statement or out of the statement. And I always kind of looked at it from a perspective of, I, I don't think the CCP is going to yeah. care yeah. what statement we make. I mean, it's a perfectly fine statement, but where, where's the leverage, yeah. right? And, and at the same point, coming back to the America First perspective of it is, well, obviously, uh, our relationship with China from a military, geopolitical, and economic, and we're also now seeing social um, really, you know, basis, is affected by this relationship. Yeah. Obviously, our... our um, uh, military, you know, um, military direct bilateral engagement with Taiwan vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan and right. being you know, democracy in, in East Asia as well as Silicon Valley le uh, West is going to be directly impacted by the CCP. So of course we should pay attention to this thing, not to mention um, the Philippines, Vietnam, and everyone else over there because this is for, you know, until, you know, I guess the Northern route gets opened up, the South China Sea is going to be your major crux point for all international trade. So all the goods that we have because of the That's system that we have, that South China Sea, that those are your major thoroughfares and Taiwan is a huge part of that. And so now would I like to see more of our supply chains come on shore? Would I like to see those semiconductors come back? I would love that. Yeah. That's another part of the America first perspective. But at the same time, we have to understand the situation that we live in now. We have to meet the situation that we live in now and then also work to get to a better situation down the road. Yeah. Uh, drawing it back, maybe big picture for a little bit, obviously, I would say you're in the weeds uh, when it comes to I can China go very in the weeds China yes. policy. <laughs> um, for everyday Americans may may not follow this as closely, although I think sure. some of that dialogue and some of that awareness has changed over the past couple of years. I think more people are starting to think about you know, one of, one of the China being different. They, I mean, we used to think that they were great, right? Because it was cheap goods that would come into the country. Cheap and, TVs. That yeah, was always cheap, the thing. Cheap right? everything. Cheap right? TVs. But I think. I don't know that they really understand the threat. And again, it's not maybe not the, the Chinese people, but the Chinese communist government, the threat to America, to the homeland. You lived and breathed it, obviously, from a, a military intelligence perspective. But what do you think that most Americans are missing? Just kind of big picture on a day to day basis. Well, one of those just to uh, comment on what you said there, it, it blows my mind because it was about 15 years ago, the first time I ever visited China and, you know, still a student and um, I was fascinated that I'd never heard of the Uyghurs before and had no idea yeah. what this group of people was, didn't even, you know, know that they existed. And I kind of vaguely had heard of the Silk Road and the connections between Rome and the various dynasties of China. So I kind of had an idea of what that was. But, you know, other than, you know, your basic like top line history book um, version of it. 
And to see now that the Uyghurs is almost a everyday word in the United States, yeah. going from 15 years ago when I remember there was uh, Mark Stein when he actually used to um, guest host for Rush Limbaugh. He did, I remember once years ago when I was living in Shanghai, he did an episode where he was talking about the Uyghurs and nobody had any idea yeah. what he was talking about. And I was sitting in Shanghai, and this is of course, because we're 12 hour time difference. So I'm trying to call in, you know, over the line, because um, <laughs> actually the place I worked, we had free international yeah. because yeah. it was an international That's business true. firm. And I'm trying to call in at like, you know, two in the morning, my time to get in. I said, Mark, because he used to call him, he used to call it Uyghur Wednesdays. And I said, Mark, I know what you're talking about. I you're a hundred percent right on this, you know, but nobody had any clue what was going on. And then, you know, to see the crackdown because the crackdowns that we're seeing now with the Uyghurs, I mean, that's, hasn't come up that that's not anything new, right? Yeah. This has been going on a long time. Yep. Uh, when I visited Xinjiang in 2010, they shut down the internet, uh, because of protests, they had uh, squads, you know, marching around the streets with AK 47s and, you know, just, just, you know, baseball bat type things and implements. Uh, just marking, marching around the regular square, and you could see what was going on. The main there's there's two main things um, that to directly connect how the CCP is two main points on how the CCP is a direct threat to yeah. Americans, right? To the everyday American. So number one, actually I guess there's three, but number one I would say is is obviously the direct threat of. I mean, we just saw COVID. Right. We just right. saw everything that happened. Yep. We saw how that was a threat to our supply chains. We saw how it was, you know, we have these questions about what was going on in this lab in Wuhan. Uh, were these, uh, you know, gain of function experiments um, being conducted with viruses that seem very similar to the one that that spread? Why won't they give us any answers on this? So we just where's went, the transparency? where's any transparency? Yeah. You know, the doctors that originally were blowing the whistle on this were arrested. One of them later died. So the fact that we still haven't have yet to you know uh, get the receipts on Wuhan mm -hmm. I think is a huge huge issue because and as we're seeing of course Shanghai is going back still you know they're yeah. re-lockdowning um, Beijing we're also now hearing a couple some I you know, just saw this today that they're closing down some of the schools in Beijing we went to a Beijing lockdown mm -hmm. on top of it and so for us to have, have lost so many lives yeah. and so many uh, dollars and so many jobs and so many businesses that went under right whether or not this thing came out of that lab, they're not telling us the truth. Yep. And so I think that that right there is better than any other argument that I can make. That's number one. Number two, though, when I was working in Shanghai, so take it back, roll it back a second. We always heard this story that um, before China came into the WTO and before China sort of ascended to this global partner, right? And we said, um, we want them to be a responsible partner. That was always right, the line right. you heard in, in the late 90s, early 2000s, responsible partner, responsible partner, responsible stakeholder. And uh, what did that mean? Well, upholding your, you know, your commitments, upholding your WTO um, regulations, upholding UN commitments. And of course, they, you know, they haven't done any of it. Um, and so we were told, though, that, and I think the American people and the people of the West writ large, you know, you heard this as well when Hong Kong was transferred back over yep. from the UK back in the 80s and then up to 97 when it happened, that if we can expose China more to the West system, that it will make China more, more open, open right, and right. liberal, and then maybe, just maybe, they can get a taste of democracy. And we saw the Tiananmen Square massacre, but prior to that, it was the Tiananmen Square protests, and they wanted freedom, and yeah. you, you know, um, they had this beautiful statue that was sort of a, you know, an homage to the Statue of Liberty that was built there, with thousands of students, and it wasn't just, um, a lot of people think it was just Beijing, but it's actually cities all across China were holding these protests. Yeah. And so there seemed to be this, this, um, this fervor there for that kind of freedom. And yet that hasn't really seemed to be the case. It hasn't quite worked out as we've opened up the economic relationship. And we keep told, keep being told again and again that, you know, they're just, you know, just wait a couple more minutes, just yeah. five more yeah. minutes, 10 more minutes. They're about, they're just about to become free. They're just about to become free. And Guns N' Roses had that whole album about it that, you know, we wouldn't come out for 20 years, um, Chinese democracy. And it's actually been the opposite, right? So the opposite is, is yeah. kind of what's happened is that as a, so many American leaders, and I saw this from governmental levels, business levels, uh, CODEL, state delegations, people would come to Shanghai and they would learn about the CCP system and they would look at the China model and they'd say, you know what, this is intoxicating. This, you know, if you want to build a maglev, so they would go to the Shanghai Municipal Planning Museum 
and they would say, well, we're building a maglev and the maglev is going to go to the airport and then we're going to build a Shanghai yep. Disneyland and uh, Disney, right? Um, it's of course, we'll get to that. Yeah, of course, it's yeah. always Disney. Yeah. Um, and so we're going to we're going to build all these things and it's going to be great. and It's going to be wonderful. And then, you know, typically, you know, some uh, one of the Americans would say, well, what about, you know, the people that, uh, you know, it seems like there's people who live here. And I say, what about them? <laughs> Yeah. What about them? Yeah. Right. You get rid of them. You get your maglev in. Disney gets their massive theme park. Uh, you get whatever you want. And the people, they, they get moved yeah, off. And if there's some historic out. buildings, like they have these, these um, Shurkuman buildings that are these incredibly intricate old um, stone built. Um, it's kind of like housing complexes that were all cent uh, you know, centered around one central courtyard mm -hmm. for the Chinese people. And they're just demolishing them left and right in Shanghai. Um, you can go and still see a few of them, yeah. but they just completely tear it apart because, you know, what do we need that for? We want progress and technology and money, and that's really what it's all about to them. And so people like Michael Bloomberg, people like Gavin Newsom, they were going over there and saying, you know what? We want this kind of system back home. We need to find ways to implement some of this at home. So a lot of those lockdown policies yeah. that I was just talking about and a lot of the COVID response that you saw, the seeds were planted for that type of really, you know, technocratic, you know, kind of governance were really planted by the CCP yeah. and by a lot of this interaction. That's a good, that's a good point. You brought up the, the Uyghurs. Um, I think when we talk about a little bit of a segue into an issue that we've talked about here at the summit, which is sort of that woke ideology. Right. Um, and so whether you talk about Disney, who films uh, movies uh, in China, or you talk about um, perhaps sports leagues or Nike or whatever it might be, all doing business with China, but then are so, uh, you know, have these, these uh, pol or positions on certain uh, political issues of the day, uh, whether it's uh, uh, legislation in the state of Florida, Disney, or whether it's, uh, you know, whatever Nike wants to talk about, BLM uh, activists or, or right. donations, but yet they don't, they seem to be fine operating in China or their Chinese market or whatever it might be. How do you write the ship there? I mean, how do you, how do you explain that to again, everyday Americans, the uh, folks who that, you know, are saying what's going on here? Why are they, why are they taking a position on this, but not on this? This is actually what is killing and hurting, uh, you know, people not only in China, but, but here in the U S as well. Like I, it's hard to explain to folks. Right. Yeah. Actually random fun fact. So where Disney actually filmed that movie, um, I think people know about this Mulan, one now, right? Mulan, Mulan in, in Xinjiang, the exact area where the Uyghurs are held. So the actress who plays Mulan is called Liu Yifei and, uh, super random. How do things happen in life? Um, when I was studying, doing my study abroad in Shanghai, we got reached out to by a movie production company that were looking for Americans uh, to a, bunch, a couple of roles, and it was this Jackie Chan Jet Li movie. Yeah. So I went out for it, did the casting, went up against a bunch of people, get in the movie. She's in the movie with me, um, Liu okay. Fei, who yeah. now plays the Mulan character, you know, total diva. Um, but um, so it doesn't surprise me that she's completely on that side because you know whatever whatever to get ahead. But yeah. then you know I guess that's you know not too different from yeah, American a lot of other, yeah, yeah a lot of Hollywood. But she made some comments around the opening of Mulan as well that I think people have missed when the Hong Kong crackdown was going on. And so this is someone I've always kind of, and by the way, yes, you can check that on IMDb. I yeah. am on there yeah. and she's on there. Uh, was the Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. Um, that she made some comments talking yeah. about how the CCP should be able to do whatever they want with Hong Kong. Hong Kong belongs to China, this is ours. And so for the Uyghur people, right, it's, it's also something where you essentially just see, it, and it is cynical and I hate to say this, but you know, we have to decide kind of, do these companies actually believe in any of the things that they, that they stand for? Do we as a people believe in anything that we stand for? Right. Do we, you know, do we still have this moral core as a society or is it cynical and is it all just based on money, transactional economic relationships, right? So yes, if you're doing business with the CCP, especially if you're doing business in the actual province of Xinjiang, of course, then yeah. of course you're co-signing what's going on there. Um, 
for these companies and corporations, this woke movement in the United States, uh, they've realized they can use that as a cudgel to go against their political enemies. Now, obviously in Florida, they're having some issues with that um, because one, someone has actually real, found a way to kind of turn the tables turn, on turn them right. yep. and, and actually fight back. But you've never, conservatives typically don't do that. Populists typically don't respond in these type of ways because there's always been this sort of laissez-faire relationship yeah. between conservative politicians and corporations. Um, but I do think it's got to a point where this this woke movement is it's a problem but it's only a problem in the united states the rest of the world doesn't want this as much and so uh, and particularly outside of you know western culture and so i think that these companies you know if i look at disney and some of the some of these things all, all elsewhere if you get more responses like yeah. a ron DeSantis to stand up to the mob isn't because what it is it's a woke mob right then I think you'll actually start to see these companies kind of turn away from that because in, at the end of the day, right, their bottom line is what, what they're, you know, more concerned so with should far, be. far more than anything yeah. else, right? It's not red or blue, it's, it's, it's the green, right, yeah. of the money. And so that being said, when it comes to the CCP particularly, uh, I think that America should approach that from a geopolitical relationship. And so, you know, when I look at the tariffs, you know, I, I don't want to connect necessarily, hey, we're putting tariffs on China because of the Uyghurs. But at the same time, if we stand for any of these human rights violations in the world, well, then clearly that's something mm -hmm. that we should at least push back against. Yeah, no, I think I think that's a good point. I think, uh, you know, you talked a little bit about Disney. I talked a little bit about Disney, I think what we're seeing out there, I think it's concerning to a lot of folks. And you're talking about, I think you're talking about Governor DeSantis and others standing up to him in the, in the legislature, what they've done the last couple of days and, and pushing some back on some of their, um, what I would say is, you know, sort of things that they've had for years and years that no one's really questioned. And the question is, do we, do, it, it seems as though conservatives and, and writ large need to do that, right? You need to make it difficult for CEOs of, of these large corporations to say, I'm going to think twice maybe about taking that public stance on that. Well, because that's, exactly that's not right. in the best interest to my shareholders. Because they're entering the political space yeah. by doing that. Right. Right. And so when you enter the political space, you become a political actor, right? When you're taking, um, you know, the company of, you know, I guess it's Walt Disney Inc. or Walt Disney Corporation. Yeah. Um, having an opinion on this bill that has nothing to do, right, with, you know. With your underlying business. Like, last time I checked, I don't think Disney actually is running schools, right, right anywhere. It's just yeah. public schools yeah. in, in right. Florida. They, they may be. I mean, apparently, had, they had this uh, self-governance, you know, district there um, around Disney World. But I actually, at Human Events, we had a source at Disney who works there in one of the parks, and they released to us some messages from the internal message board, um, they call them cast members, oh, I think right? I saw this. I saw um, this. Called yeah. the hub of Disney, of people saying, look, we don't wanna get involved in politics. Yeah. We don't wanna turn off half our audience. We just want to have a great park, provide good experience for yeah. families. We don't wanna get involved. That's even some people, you know, and not to, you know, I'm not trying to score any woke points by saying this, but I even saw one post that said, look, the guy was saying, I'm gay, but I support this bill because I think that's something that should be left to the parents. Of course. That that isn't something that should have anything to do with teachers and schools or public, you know, teachers unions and any form of government, that it's just should be a personal choice and, and a personal, well, you know, conversation that's held yeah. between, um, you know, between parents and, and their kid because it's so personal. And, you know, looking at this coming from an actual Disney cast member, you know, maybe think, you know, the yeah. thousands of people that work there, guess what? You know, they just want to do a good job. They're not really interested in getting involved in these things. Yeah. I mean, that brings up two great points. One is it seems like, you know, certain members of the left um, really, you know, have gone, you know, really on this on this war against parents for whatever reason. So we saw that in the state of Virginia. Uh, with, you know, Glenn Youngkin's uh, election, some would say mm -hmm. it was all about that. You just brought up, obviously, what's going on in Florida and saying, should that decision be made by the parent of whether I'm going to engage my third grader in a discussion about that? Right. Or should it be left up or should, you know, should that discussion happen in the school system? Well, I think, again, most reasonable Americans would say absolutely not should not happen in the school season. That, that's my job as a parent. Right. to do this and to decide when to have that conversation, if at all, or, or whenever. But it seems like time and time again, you know, we don't have that right policy coming from the federal government. They're saying, nope, you know, we know what's best for 
your children well, it across is, the board? It, it, it's a fundamental uh, difference of opinion on, it, it's really talking about power, it's talking about the next generation, and this is clearly a generational struggle yeah. over, you know, do we want to continue having traditional moral values, yeah. traditional structures in the United States, or do we want to come to a situation where you've got these actors who are becoming far and far more politicized, and uh, my good friend Lives of TikTok does a great job of documenting this time and time again, of just showing what's being said by the teachers yeah, in these schools. Crazy. And so you realize that it, it has become a form of political indoctrination. If you can indoctrinate children to think that mom and dad are wrong and mom and dad yeah. are part of the problem, right? Then you've planted that seed that can go all the way through. And by the way, um, of course, you know, if Media Matters gets a hold of this, they're going to say, oh, so because, you know, um, <laughs> this is what they do to the kids in the Uyghur concentration camps. Um, they go in and they teach them that, no, 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 you, you know, don't listen to your parents, right? They're getting it all wrong. You have to follow yeah. the precepts of the CCP. You need to speak Mandarin. You need to, um, there's certain names, by the way, traditional uh, Uyghur names that are not allowed in some cases wow. because, yeah. you know, they, they want to even um, sinocize kind of the actual names of the people in some of these cases. And so they take the kids, they separate them from the parents, and they send them off for what's essentially called re-education. Now, when it's happening to the Uyghurs, I think 90% of people can point to that and say, okay, this is a problem. Like, we don't, yeah. we don't like this. We don't want more of this. But when you look at the United States and you see similar things happening, right, you've got somehow the massive corporations that are going along with it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a great point. Let me jump back uh, real quick, um, circle back, uh, when we talk about uh, China and Taiwan. Jinsaki ruined that phrase. Yeah, you can't I know. Say it anymore. It's, it's terrible. Um, it's come up Taiwan. With a... um, obviously, there's a lot of concern there. Um, the events that are happening with Russia, Ukraine, right. can't be separated, I don't think, in my opinion, I don't think you can to, to what's going on in China and perhaps in Taiwan. You've lived in the region, obviously. What's your take? I mean, I depending on who you talk to and who you listen to it's either on the cusp taiwan is being invaded or it's years away mm. uh but does xi jinping i mean is that 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 is a goal i assume well, it's that's clear, a goal. it's clearly a goal and xi jinping has stated this so xi jinping is um and this was the focus of of my newsweek piece specifically um you know someone who actually got to briefly meet um mm -hmm. when i was in shanghai uh he was the shanghai party chairman at one point the general secretary right. for the city um, back in about 2008, I ran into him at a planning meeting for the World Expo. So it was the World Expo was being held in 2010, but yep. you know they were in this planning thing and just you know huge entourage as you can imagine, shoulder off the cuff, you know trench coat kind of, of thing. Um, and he's, he's a big guy. He's very tall. He's he's six three, which in, in China that's very much taller than average. Um, so just commanding presence of the yep. whole room and. Um, you know, you could, and everyone deferred to him. And so we, you, even back then, because that was just before he joined the, the um, Politburo Central Committee, I mean, everybody knew that he was on the way up. Yeah. We didn't realize how high up he would get at that point, um, but someone I paid attention to for a long time. And so this November, it's looking more and more certain that he will essentially receive his crown uh, at the 20th Party Congress yep. as paramount leader for life of the CCP. Now, the CCP has only had one other leader for life prior to this, and that, of course, was Chairman Mao Zedong. Yep. Um, pro since then, you had Deng Xiaoping, uh, who served for, you know, give or take, about 30 years um, in various positions, but then they were trying to set up this system of 10-year cycles, so a 10-year term for the president, 10-year term for the president, and then they would step down and then new yeah. one would come up. You know, I, I don't like to call them president because they're not actually elected, so I, I would say chairman. Um, but, and actually in Chinese, you would say chairman. You would never say president Xi. It just wouldn't make any sense. Um, that he will essentially receive this. He's wiping out the last of his, uh, these factions that may have been against him in opposition. He's going through and systematically purging them. Actually, the number one TV show on China, in China right now is um, his political opponents giving these um, confessions essentially on TV as like a almost like a reality TV series, and it's been they've gone through a couple seasons of it it's now, and they show it across CCTV, yeah. and oh, you know of course it's always corruption, yeah. and you know you've you know you've done wrong, and they admit it, and how could I do this? How could I have sinned against the party and against my country? And you know I accept my punishment and all these terrible things, and it's it's the number one show, and so uh, there is a faction that did stand in opposition to Xi Jinping, it was controlled by the previous president, Jiang Zemin, 
previous chairman, and they're essentially called the Shanghai faction because that really was their power base. Yeah. A lot of people have pointed out the fact that some, possibly some of the reason that he's been so harsh to Shanghai, that city, uh, 26 million people, largest, most populous, um, wealthiest city in all of China, most developed city clearly in all of China, uh, at least mainland China, um, is because as sort of a punishment or a humiliation of that faction on the way to receiving his crown later this fall. But when, when you look at a guy like Xi Jinping when it, vis -a vis Taiwan, to get back to your question, um, I don't do that politician thing where I forget the question and <laughs> right. then I just you, go off. You answer the question you want to answer. Um, the, but asked. I don't think that initially, right, prior to a lot of the thing, the, the initial plan for Taiwan was osmosis, right? Um, isolate the island from the rest of the world economy, isolate them diplomatically. You know, it started with um, the CCP, mainland China and Beijing taking their seat at the UN back mm -hmm. in the 1970s. And then slowly and slowly, systemically, just, just you know, yeah. bring the, you know, make yep. it so. Oh, it looks like your infrastructure is falling apart. Oh, well, maybe you need a bank loan. Maybe you need some some extra services. Yeah. Maybe you need some internet set up. Maybe some cell phone towers. Hey, you know, maybe you need some Huawei in there, right? So you right. want some 5G? 5G, hey, there you have, you go. Help you out. So you know, that's sort of been yeah. the way. And of course, you know, they speak the same language, um, and so a lot of familial ties as well. And so it's, uh, it's, it's always been this sort of thing where they've just been slowly working their way across. And the two political parties in Taiwan, one of them, the KMT, is you know, for that sort of normalization of relations, where it's the DPP, it stands more for independence. And what's interesting, though, is it almost feels like that's completely out the window after the events of Ukraine yeah. and even prior to that, the events of Hong Kong, because Hong Kong was always seen as this sort of this model for how a reunification with Taiwan would look. And that was always the CCP's pitch to Taiwan to say, look, one country, two systems. So, you know, we're gonna allow Hong Kong to be Hong Kong. They're just gonna be kind of be under our umbrella now since, the 19, yeah. since 1997. Well, in 2019, that all went out the window, right? They <laughs> right. said, you know, well, this is new. This is the new communism. It's communism with Chinese characteristics. We've totally changed. We're over a new leaf. We're not the people of Tiananmen Square anymore. And everybody sort of said, well, yeah, I'm not really sure if I can trust that, but you know, we'll, we'll, we're making a lot of money off of this. So, you know, we'll see if we can go along with yeah. it. And then 2019 happens and, oh, okay, no, it's just communism. It's just yeah. same old regular communism. So I think at this point, um, you know, they always say as an analyst, you never want to make predictions because, you know, then you're, you know, then you can be judged. Right. But I think at this point it, it, it turns up the timetable a lot faster for Taiwan, I think for Xi Jinping, if this faction does create any problems for him, then going after Taiwan would be the obvious move to mm -hmm. be able to turn back to the Chinese people and say, look, I, I did what no other chairman was able to do since you know 1949 and this whole thing got started, right? The, yeah. the separation. And so- um, and Does that mean that you know, sitting here in the United States, obviously, should we be doing more things proactive today than we are doing, right? So we saw, I like to say, you know, particularly as, as the, the Biden administration's response to Ukraine was sort of leading from behind. We probably should have done a number of things a little bit more proactive. Well, I, th I think deterrence is, yeah. is really the best policy. And I said this on the Charlie Kirk show. I said it to Congressman Crenshaw when I said, I, number one, fix the Navy, right? Yeah. The, the more we can do to fix the Navy and actually the same kind of, you know, wokeness that's going into our corporations we find throughout our military. So yeah. we fix the Navy, right? We show that we can conduct serious military operations but in Seventh Fleet, where so I that's the deterrent. You know, so that's a huge part. Well, it's not the only deterrent, but it does show that we we are now serious about defending our military interests in these yeah. parts of the world. And I think that um, after the events of and you know continuing events of Ukraine, um, it certainly got you know the same way that um, you know the United States has their establishment. We have our foreign policy uh, blob, as they call yeah. it. You know, Zhongnanhai and. Uh, you know, Beijing has their, they have their hawks, right? And they've got people who say, take Taiwan, take it right now. And these are throughout the military. And Xi Jinping is very close with the military, very, very close. He's put the military under his direct control. The Politburo doesn't have as much control over the mm -hmm. military as they used to. It's not really separated. It's more of a direct line control at this point. And so um, if he's going to go do this, I mean, it would look like, it, it would be a naval blockade. That yeah. would be the first thing. Um, you know, it's kind of one of those break it, you bought it situations. So, you know, he doesn't want to destroy Taiwan because then he would have to rebuild but Taiwan. Yeah. There'd yeah. be no one there. You'd lose your your industry and the heavy industry and the semiconductor is obviously what he wants. 
So I think a naval blockade, starve out, isolation, that would be the kind of things. And the yeah. only thing really preventing him from doing that, number one, is the economic relationship with the United States. And then number two, the U.S. military, particularly the U.S. Navy. What about, what about a number three, which would be leadership? in the U.S. Oh, well, right? <laughs> of mean, course, you, what, you, what, you, what, you would need U.S. Factor, leadership in order in, right? to, <laughs> yes, He's in, or, say, in look, order to have any I, of these I, things. I think from maybe what I saw in Ukraine and elsewhere, maybe I've got a, maybe there's a little give there. Maybe I can take a little bit. Whereas, well, and, and the, the worry there, of course, is that, um, uh, you know, I think, I think nobody's really asking the question, and people will ask, you know, why did Vladimir Putin decide to invade Ukraine? But I don't think nobody's even, no one's really asking the question, why did he choose now? Yeah. Right. I think, think that's kind of, you know. That's the question. Self-evident. Yeah. yeah. And the same, so the same would go for Xi Jinping uh, at a time when the U.S. seems rudderless, um, when, you know, we have these huge internal debates. Yeah. And we can't even pick, you know, what side we're on on anything. Um, military is having, we experienced Afghanistan, obviously. And then, you know, on the heels of that, everything that's going on in Ukraine right now, um, it doesn't seem like the U.S. is ready to stand up for allies or stand up to defend anyone like this. And so if you want to actually, you know, achieve this level of deterrence, it all starts with leadership. Absolute yeah. leadership and clarity of leadership. Absolutely. hundred percent. You get your thoughts on a couple of different issues. Uh, we're going to shift uh, to the border. Mm -hmm. Border crisis going on, been going on. Do now. we still have a border? I wasn't well, sure. It's it's debatable. It's debatable. Yes. I think that's it a, seems, that's seems like the question. minute you left it, boy, it just it's uh, an open question. Disappeared. Obviously near dear in my heart, but you know, from your perspective, and you talk to a variety of different different folks uh, probably than I do every day. What, I mean, what's your view on what what's the end goal here? What what's the they have a plan in place. They keep saying it. We have a plan in place and we're executing on the plan. I can't figure it out. <laughs> you can walk and chew gum. Yeah, right? But if it, let's, let's take them at their word that there is a plan in place. What's the, what's the end result? What, what's the end goal at the end of the day if their plan is fully executed as they say it's being executed? What's the end result? I, I'm, I'm having a hard time figuring it out. You know, you, you've got really this political alliance um, in this country, and it's, it isn't even just that, you know, I, I don't want to say it's all Democrats, but it certainly it seems to be, you know, it, unless you're right there on the border themselves, like some, some of the Democrats in the Rio Grande Valley are actually a little bit, yeah. a little bit better on Throwing this. Throwing up their hands. Um, yeah. Because, you know, they're, they're facing this onslaught. But you realize that there's so much money that's coming out of places like not um, like HHS, um, yeah. these third party organizations, these non-governmental organizations that, you know, they look at all of this as, so from the cartel perspective, it's human trafficking. They're making money for every person they get across the border, but we don't talk as much about the money that's being siphoned off from the U.S. government, from the U.S. taxpayers into these other organizations that are also getting paid from all of this. And then their connections, of course, to politicians. So I really do think they've turned it into a, a quasi industry at this yeah. point. Yeah. I think what you're referencing and there, they don't. And, and by the way, they could care less what happens to everybody who's caught in the middle. And I think we just saw um, a Texas National Guard soldier, um, unfortunately, passed yeah, away. Passed I, away. I, didn't, I didn't see all the details, but I saw the headline. Uh, I was just I was talking with the lieutenant governor of Texas. He said um, it was a, during a rescue in the river. Wow. Um, so something that's not really talked about, you know, when you have the Biden administration, you're going to get me on a little bit of a rant. The Biden administration, particularly the president and the vice president, talk about Border Patrol, how they're whipping migrants, right, which we all know is a lie. You even have the secretary making some very damaging remarks. Yeah, those are called reins. Anyone yeah. who's ridden a horse But these are the same are. individuals. In this case, it's not Border Patrol because Border Patrol is not actually allowed to do their job. But if they were, these are the same individuals that will jump in the river. And it's a, it's a difficult uh, current at times, depending right. on where you're at in that river. That will jump in the river and that will rescue migrants every day of the every day of the week twice on sunday they'll jump in there if they see them under distress and they'll go in because they care they care about these individuals they don't like the policy but they're going to do their job at the end of the day in this case unfortunately it was a national guard member who was trying to execute a rescue that evidently did not you know didn't go well wow. uh at the end of the day so obviously our our hearts and, and prayers are with uh, his family and and everyone that um, he has survived by but look at the end of the day this is a this is a well, existential to, threat or not I mean existential. I, I would just put on that you know it's when you look at that you also have to talk about 
what was the constellation of issues and policies that led to him being in that situation in the first yeah. place? Well, federal government not doing their job. Right. Right. So someone else has to step in. State of Texas has to bring National Guard in. Right. DPS officers and everything else. So it's it's tough. It's a tough issue. Um, and, you know, I was down on the border about two weeks ago, maybe a week and a half ago, mm -hmm. talking to Border Patrol officers. And they're just they're beside themselves. They're like, you know, we just want to do our job. Right. And the job is enforcing the law at the end of the day. And, well, I and it's, you know, I, I always say uh, about this, you know, when you're looking at some of these other countries, you know, I, I, I talk about China a lot and I say China would never allow this. Not we're, in the we're second. the only country that allows we're, we're the this. only country in the world that allows our borders to be treated this way, that treats our sovereignty like it's like it's a joke. Yeah. Um, no other serious country would allow this this type and certainly not in these numbers that we're seeing to come. No serious country would ever consider this sustainable. It just wouldn't be done, yeah. period. That's why I go back to, you know, what's the plan or not the plan? What's the end goal at the end of the day? Evidently, there is a goal. Um, they're not really sharing it right. uh, with anyone. I think that's that's You've got a plan, that, but you can't that, see it. That's something that, you know, that's one of these things that they probably don't want to say out loud uh, would be my guess mm -hmm. uh, what their end goal is. But um, it, it's a frustrating thing. We've talked a lot about it here at the Policy Summit. Uh, we'll continue to talk about it because I think the more that you talk about it, you more get, the more that you get the facts out there, the more that people are like, well, this isn't right. You know, what they're saying about asylum seekers, not quite right. What they're saying about, you know, it's only women and, and children coming across that border. Maybe that's not the case. There are MS-13 members. There are bad people coming into this country every day to do Americans harm. And there's a big welcome sign. I mean, we, says, we, we don't even discuss it really in, in the proper terms. I mean, there's there are cartel wars going on course. right across our border from some of the most horrific. You can talk about the horrors that are coming out of Ukraine and Mariupol and these various areas, Donbass. But... Let's talk about what's going on in Ciudad Juarez. Let's talk about what's going on in Tijuana. Let's talk about the fact that, you know, you can't go visit, you know, places like uh, Cancun and Cozumel and Acapulco that, you know, used to be these, you know, JFK took his honeymoon with yeah. uh, Jackie O in, in, in Acapulco. I, you wouldn't go there today yeah. um, because these places have been taken over by gangs, by cartels, so many of these regions. And, you know, I always kind of say, like, if we're going to do this nation building stuff, you know, I, I wouldn't mind doing a little bit of it, you know, just, you know, right here at home yeah, where it right. actually directly affects people. So let's actually start focusing on, on what's killing 100,000 Americans every single year, and that's the illegal narcotics. Right. Vast majority, I would say over 85% probably come across that border. That's right. Um, and so it's okay, you know, if we want to make sure that Ukraine is safe, secure, and I know we've got a lot of security concerns over there, but why don't, why don't we have some military, why don't we have that same level of concern on our southern border? It just it mystifies not only myself, but I think just a lot of everyday Americans that say this is this is crazy. It actually kind of um, one thing that I always find fascinating because I, I I always like to make references to media and I don't know it's because I grew up in the '90s. But you know, uh, the number one show in in America, what are these? Is Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Yeah. And these are directly about the cartels. And there's a whole movie series called the Sicario series that's about this. And you know, TV shows and movies being made constantly. Narcos. Um, about this situation, and yet there's a disconnect somehow from that and actual policy yeah. being made in Washington. And I think, you know, for me, that when I see a disconnect like that, I, I say, follow the money. You got to follow the yeah. money. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jack Posobic, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Human Events, uh, senior editor. Yep. Congratulations on that. Obviously, Appreciate a podcast it. over there as well. Uh, and thanks for everything that you do for the America First movement, for being here at the Policy Summit. Uh, great conversation. Great to get your take on a lot of these issues. I know the listeners are, are, are going to be very, very fascinated as well. So thanks for your time. You can catch the America First Agenda, every uh, America First podcast, every other uh, week um, at agenda.americafirstpolicy.com or wherever you get your favorite podcast. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary Wolf. Right.